Thank you. All right, uh, hello everyone. My name is uh, Björn Reitenberg, and today I'll be talking about bypassing Adobe Flash input validation. So a little bit about myself. Um, I'm an information security student. I have a background in electrical engineering and computer science. I'm a software developer, but mostly I'm a security researcher um, for fun. And uh, well, I found several vulnerabilities in some uh, popular projects, including Adobe Flash. And Adobe Flash is what I will be talking about today. And also about bug bounties, because when you leave this room tonight, um, I want you, uh, the, the takeaway that I want to give you is uh, logic box that, um, that simply boils down to having a look at the specs because today I will just be talking about logic box and you can do it too. What you need for that is just common developer tools and a little bit of curiosity, a little bit of dedication. Um, so to give you an idea if you uh, do it the right way of what you can get, uh, here, here are the numbers. So. Quickly moving on to Adobe Flash. Just in case you're not already uh, familiar with it, Adobe Flash is a uh, cross-platform application runtime. Um, it runs inside your browser as a plugin, um, but you can also use it to run standalone applications on a desktop and on uh, your mobile phone. Some of the use cases that Adobe Flash is used for um, are well, streaming protected media, um, browser-based games, audio and video conferencing, um, and basically any general purpose application that you can think of. It is a cross-platform in the sense that it runs on Windows, uh, Linux, and Mac OS as well. Right, so if you have a Flash application, um, it starts with ActionScript code. And ActionScript code is compiled to what is called an SWF binary. Uh, and this binary, then you can embed in well any of, of these uh, file formats. So the most uh, common one is HTML pages, but you can also embed it in PDFs and Office documents. Right, so a little bit about uh, Flash sandbox security. Um, tonight I'll be talking about the top two, starting with the remote sandbox. The remote sandbox is actually uh, the default one and the uh, one you'll um, probably be familiar with in the sense that it allows you to um, access a remote servers, but it does not allow you to access the local file system. And this is the default sandbox that uh, most applications will be running in if you visit the website that uh, hosts the Flash application. Now the other one is uh, the exact opposite, um, local with file system. It allows you to access the local file system, but it does not allow you to uh, connect to remote servers. So starting with the local with file system sandbox, uh, this sandbox is actually triggered when you have a local HTML file that embeds flash content. Uh, so pretty straightforward, but there's a couple of uh, definitions that are important here. So uh, it's a little bit hard to read, but I'll just go through it. Um, Adobe's definition uh, for starting with the, the sandbox itself is that the default sandbox for local Flash applications um, is the, the sandbox which may not contact the internet. Um, they may not access basically any network endpoints with addresses such as HTTP URLs. So, well, that's pretty straightforward, but there's another definition that is important here, a local file. So basically what constitutes a local Flash application. Um, and Adobe says that, well, a local Flash application describes any file reference by using the file protocol or a human C path, which does not include an IP address or a qualifying domain. Well, that's kind of a wordy definition, right? And there are actually two important things here because this file protocol and this UNC path, what, what are those actually? And also, how does this ex exclusion of an IP address or a qualifying domain uh, affect the former two protocols? Well, let's have a look at that. But first, 
If you've ever used Windows uh, file sharing, then you'll probably be familiar with this screen. And what you're actually using under the hood is a protocol called SMB or Server Message Block. And closely related to SMB is actually the Universal Naming Convention or UNC. UNC is actually a, a scheme that allows you to express paths to an SMB server. So yeah, you, here's an example. Um, but in addition to shared files, you can also reference uh, other things like devices and uh, named pipes. And you can use any of these uh, host identifiers like an IP address, a domain, uh, but also what is called a net bias uh, host name. So that is, that is quite, um, quite a few details there. And the question of course arises, um, what UNC paths are accepted by Flash? Well, let's have a look. Here are some examples. Uh, the first one, would it be accepted by Flash? Well, no, because it's an IP address. The second one, some server.com, would that be accepted by Flash? No, because it's a domain. Now, the last one, um, intuitively you would say no, but the answer is yes, but only if the local host name is some PC. So there, uh, there's a bit of ambiguity going on here. And we'll see later how that comes into play. Right, so the uh, other scheme that is being accepted by Flash is the file URI. And the uh, file URI is actually an interesting one in the sense that in practice, it only allows you to uh, reference the local file system. In theory, it would allow you to reference um, remote servers, but uh, the specification is such that it actually doesn't really allow you to do that in practice. So most Im implementations, actually all of them, just ignore remote host names. And therefore, in practice, you can only uh, reference the local file system. So here's an example. We have a document docx hosted on local C drive. And uh, well, in terms of Flash, there are actually no restrictions. Um, but yeah, there are not really any restrictions necessary, right? Because you cannot exp express remote paths anyway. Right, so to summarize, we have the local with file system sandbox. It lets us access um, uh, UNC and file schemes, but well, the first one is heavily restricted by Flash to only the local host. And uh, the file scheme actually only takes local paths. So if you want to escape the local sandbox, where do we go from here? Well, let's uh, talk again about pass expressions on Windows because Flash is a uh, cross-platform application runtime. And that means that on Windows, it uses the uh, what is called a uh, the Win32 shell API. The Win32 shell API, it's, um, well, there's a book over here that, that I found. It says Windows 2000, but it's actually much older than that. And this Win32 shell API has a bit of, um, well, oddities that we can use, a bag of tricks. So let's do just, uh, just that, because it allows to actually express the file scheme using, uh, sorry, the, the UNC syntax inside the file scheme. Well, what does that mean? Well, on top we have a path to an SMB server expressed in UNC syntax. If we want to express that in the file scheme using the Win32 shell API, we just add another slash and then swap forward and backslashes of the uh, UNC syntax. And then we have a new path. Well, it turns out that Flash now uh, considers this path to be local, but it is actually a path to a remote SMB server. So that means now we can access remote SMB servers from the local sandbox. So this is, of course, uh, very nice, but we would like to uh, grab some files first, right, and exfiltrate them. So how do we do that? Well, the, uh, the basic approach is, um, uh, well, first, there, there are no APIs in Flash that allow you to upload a file, so we need to come up with something else. And the basic approach is you basically read a local file 
and then append it to the SMB requests that you make. So there's a couple of steps that you need to take. Uh, first, you read the uh, arbitrary local file that, that you want. But there are a couple of, of things that you need to take into consideration because the SMB protocol um, comes with a number of <coughs> limits that you need to overcome. So for example, your path re requests cannot be longer than 260 bytes. And you also need to avoid forbidden characters. So what you basically do is just split the file that you want to send and you use URL encoding to um, basically hide the uh, forbidden characters. Then you append all the chunks to the SMB resource uh, requests, you make the requests, and then finally on the attacker side, you just capture them and, uh, well, URL decode them and then reconstruct the entire file. Right, so uh, <laughs> let's see how that's going to work in practice. Okay, so before I start, um, on the left we have the, uh, the attacker side uh, where I'll be running a Python script that, that acts as an SMB server, but what it is actually doing is logging all the SMB requests. And on the right side we have the, uh, the victim machine running Windows 10, um, and the victim will be opening a very trustworthy looking file. So just running the Python script first. Then the user opens this, uh, this file. Now we see a lot of things happening, but what it is doing, it's reading the uh, Windows host file, splitting it up and sending it in segments. Um, and as you can see, we have fully reconstructed the file on the attacker end. Right, so we can escape the local sandbox, we can steal files, but there's something interesting going on here because our exploit chain allows, you, uh, allows us to actually access remote SMB servers. So that raises the question, can we actually leverage SMB for other kinds of attacks? Well, let's talk about SMB first, in particular SMB authentication. Um, S SMB supports various authentication schemes, but uh, the default one is NTLM v2. And in NTLM v2, you log on using a username and using a hash of the user password. And there's a challenge response uh, mechanism involved. Now I'll go briefly through how it works. So uh, on the right, we have the user. Uh, the user has a username and password, enters it to log on to the Windows machine. Um, and then instructs the Windows client to connect to the SMB server. So what actually happens is that the Windows client sends the username in plain text, the server sends back a, a random challenge, and the Windows client uses this, this challenge to encrypt uh, a hash of the user passwords and sends it back. Now if everything went well, then the server authorizes the user to access um, the resource that the user wanted. Now this seems, or might seem, a solid, uh, solid protocol, but it is is not really because there are several attacks uh, uh, possible, and one of them is called the SMB relay attack. Um, so just to go briefly through that, uh, the user again enters the username and a password, and the Windows client again logs on to, um, or tries to log on to the server, but this time there is an attacker in the middle. So that means that when the username is being sent in plain text, the attacker has the username. 
and then forwards it to the server. Now the server will respond and send a random challenge back. And that means the attacker has the random challenge. The attacker forwards the challenge back to the client. Uh, the client uses that to encrypt a hash of the password and sends it back to the attacker. Well, the attacker has the, uh, the challenge, so he trivially decrypts it and obtains the hash of the user password. Finally, this, uh, this sequence is forward to the server, and that means that the, uh, the attacker can actually authenticate himself, impersonate the user on the server side, and uh, perform any actions on the user's behalf. So the bottom line is, the attacker obtains the username and the hash of the user password. So if you have this hash, what can you actually do with it? Well, um, first of all, you can mount a so-called pass the hash attack. And uh, there are two variants. The first one is that the attacker authenticates on a third party host that the victim is allowed to access. And that is what we've just uh, seen on the previous slide. Uh, the other one is that the attacker authenticates on the, the client machine, so the victim machine itself. But this was patched by uh, Microsoft. Unfortunately, there are other things you can do. You can try to obtain the uh, plain text password, and you can do that by using rainbow tables, or you can try to brute force the hash. And just to give you an idea, an eight character password permutation can be brute forced in under six hours. And this is actually a number from 2012. So you can imagine that with today's hardware, uh, things might just go faster than that. Right, so what does that mean for uh, our attacker scenario? We have a malicious slash application, our malicious slash application. Um, so basically we can instruct it to um, connect to an SMB server that we can control. Now there's an attack variant um, that we can use here and uh, for that we'll use a Python script which is called SMB trap. Now, SMB trap has two roles. It acts as an SMB server, but at the same time, it also logs user credentials. And that basically means that on our attacker controlled server, we simply swap the legit legitimate SMB server for SMB trap. So let's just go uh, through how that actually works. Uh, because there's something different here this time. Um, it's not the uh, actual user initiating the request to the SMB server, but our malicious flash application. So that means that Windows first will try to authenticate as a guest. But this is not what we want. So basically we tell the Windows client to say, um, okay, you're not allowed to access the resource without authenticating. And this basically means that the original lock-on process is being restored in the sense that the Windows client will just send the username in plain text, um, the server will send back the challenge, and the Windows client will send a hash of the password encrypted using that uh, challenge. And now I'm going to show you how, that's work, uh, how that will work in practice. <coughs> Right, so again, uh, like last time, on the left we have the attacker host, on the right we have the victim machine running Windows 10. And now on the attacker host I'll be running the SMB trap script. And on the right hand side the user will again open a uh, very trustworthy looking file. And as you can see, it logs on to the SMB server and um, the SMB server or SMB trap root forces it and verifies it to be the password, well, which is a very strong one, as you can see. Right, so uh, to recap, we have a local sandbox escape. We can exfiltrate local files, uh, disclose them to a remote server of our choosing, and we can steal Windows user credentials. 
Now the question is, how is this actually possible? Well, it appears that there are a number of fin fundamental issues in sandbox policies, starting with these definitions. So, um, local with file system and, and local file. The way Adobe defines them is very wordy and, well, in a sense, um, ambiguous. And this, this de definition leads to a blacklist approach that apparently is not covering all corner cases. And one of those corner cases is, well, our file URI, um, the file URI, which is being considered as local, which means that our uh, file URL is actually being whitewashed um, and, and taken to be local, while it is actually a remote path. And this finally renders Flash to, uh, well, subject to SMB vulnerabilities. So, um, a bit of other details. The vulnerability is actually host environment agnostic in the sense that uh, it, it affects Firefox, Chrome, Edge, Internet Explorer, and Microsoft Office. Um, Chrome and Edge are actually two special cases because they have a sandbox which is uh, used to uh, wrap around the Flash plugin, so a sandbox on top of the Flash sandbox. But despite this um, mechanism, the SMB connections are still allowed. Now it appears that these uh, sandbox policies that we're talking about, they were introduced in version 9, Flash version 9, so that is, um, uh, well, that is a version that is, was released in 2006, and that means that this vulnerability has actually been present in Flash for over 10 years. Right, so uh, Flash Player 23, that, uh, that version actually fixes this vulnerability, and it does that by introducing new sandbox policies. So the first one is that it drops the, the local with file system sandbox entirely, and uh, well, that means that the file system APIs are of no use anymore, so they've been dropped as well. And uh, finally, it defaults to uh, what is called the local with networking sandbox, which is basically equivalent to the remote sandbox um, in the sense that you, you have still a file running locally, but the application won't be able to access the local file system. Now this is quite a change um, because uh, this, this sandbox has been part of Flash for over 10 years, and that's meant that developers had to refactor their uh, existing Flash applications. And quite ironically, that, that means that local file system interaction requires HTML5 techniques, which at the time was still being considered a uh, competitor to Flash. Right, so these are the release notes for Flash Player 23. Um, it in, uh, announces the new sandbox policies, but if you take a close look at them, there is no mentioning of the remote sandbox. So could it be that they haven't fixed the remote sandbox? Well, that is a question that I've asked myself, uh, so uh, let's have a look. It turns out that they actually did change the remote sandbox, um, because if you try to um, make outbound, outbound requests to UNC, uh, to, to a server that is addressed by a UNC or file style path, it will get rejected. In fact, any URL that is not prefixed by HTTP or HTTPS is being uh, rejected. So that leads to the conclusion that Flash Player 23 actually silently introduced a whitelist approach. Any URL that is not being prefixed by HTTP will get rejected. Well, that seems like a solid approach, right? So where do we go from here? Well, let's go back to SMB. Now, to uh, recall, we are restricted to HTTP. So how do we get from HTTP to SMB? Well, there's a new attack factor called redirect to SMB. And uh, I will go briefly through how it actually works. So you have uh, an HTTP client. It requests some file. Uh, .txt uh, for, from the HTTP server, and uh, the server sends a response, a redirect response, but in the location header, it will not actually put um, a location that is prefixed by HTTP, but by the file URI. 
And this URL is not just some URL, but it is incorporating UNC syntax. So it is um, actually addressing a remote server. Now this vulnerability in, is actually uh, part of uh, the low-level Windows APIs. Um, and here are a couple of functions that are affected. So that means that any application that uses these low-level Windows APIs um, is actually affected. And that raises the question, is Flash uh, affected as well? Well, here's the basic idea to, to test for that. Um, we have our malicious Flash application running on the client and it does a GET request on our attacker controlled server. And the server sends back a redirect response, uh, 302. And in the location header, we put our, um, uh, our URL to our SMB server using file syntax. Now, and finally, if everything went well, then the client will connect to our malicious SMB server. Right, so the first try, um, it didn't really work. Um, because, well, as you can see, uh, there's, there's an excerpt from Wireshark Trace here. Um, it, it does the HTTP GET request, and we send back our HTTP 302 response, but we see no SMB traffic. So that means our attack is being blocked. But there's something interesting going on here. This thing on top, it says, there's an HTTP GET request for a file called crossdomain.xml. Well, that is actually interesting because we didn't program our Flash application to do that. So, yeah, the question is, what is happening here? Well, this crossdomain.xml is actually um, a reference to what Adobe calls a crossdomain policy file. And this crossdomain policy file is a mechanism used to dicta dictate when the SWF, the Flash application, is allowed to load resources from another domain other than the one it is originally hosted on. So to give you an example, um, if the Flash application is hosted on domain A.com, um, it cannot load any images from domain B.com if domain B.com does not explicitly allow the other, to, other domain to do so. So here's the... Uh, uh, definition given by Adobe. Again, a very wordy explanation, as you can see. Um, but the interesting thing is, there's a lot of talk going on about domains. But what we're actually interested in is what happens when we do cross-protocol data handling, because we're trying to redirect from HTTP to SMB. Well, despite the fact that um, this cross-domain policy file should not actually be involved in this, uh, in this mechanism. Our attack is still being blocked. Um, but yeah, if you have a close look at our Wireshark trace, we see that crossdomain.xml is actually requested on the machine that hosts our Flash application. And that is actually um, contradicting the definition. But okay. Let's see what happens. We'll just construct a least restrictive cross-domain policy. So basically, uh, just a few lines of XML code, which says, okay, any Flash application can load any resource um, from this domain. And now I'll show you what happens when we feed that um, XML file in practice. Right, so again, uh, like before, we have the attacker host on the left side and uh, the victim machine on the right side. Starting with the attacker host, we'll be running two Python scripts. Uh, on the top part of the terminal, I'll be running a uh, uh, web server, and this web server will be hosting our Flash application, but it also will issue the um, 302 response. And on the lower part, I will be running SMB trap. So let's do just that. We run the scripts. And then uh, the victim will be running Internet Explorer this time. 
and we'll be navigating to the uh, Flash application hosted on the web server. And again, as you can see, um, the sandbox restrictions are being circumvented. And again, we are able to uh, obtain the user password. Okay, so we have a remote sandbox escape this time. And actually, this vulnerability circumvents Adobe's patch for the first vulnerability. And as a result, uh, we can again steal Windows user credentials. Now the question is, how is this possible? Well, um, to start off, this new whitelist approach it is a seemingly solid one, but input validation is actually only done once, which means that the initial HTTP request is validated, but if there are any uh, redirect responses, those are not validated, and that means that Flash is again being rendered susceptible to SMB vulnerabilities. <coughs> now this time um, it affects Firefox, Internet Explorer and Microsoft Office. Um, it does not affect Chrome and Edge, which is pretty interesting. And that means that these uh, sandboxes, probably as a result to the previous vulnerability, no longer allow outbound SMB connections. And for Chrome, because it's an open source project, and because Chrome has some nice debugging functionalities, we can actually see that is the case. So we have here um, an output of what is called net internals. And if we take a closer look, we see that uh, once the HTTP redirect response is being processed, uh, the redirect is not taken because it's being considered an unsafe redirect. Right, so Flash Player 26 fixes this vulnerability and it does that by applying input validation to redirects as well. And that means that the redirect to SMB vulnerability um, um, has been mitigated. All right, so um, some concluding remarks. What I've talked about is just logic bugs. And logic bugs, well, that basically means you just examine the specs um, and try to find uh, any inconsistencies in them. And the best thing about logic box, in, in my personal opinion, is that they cannot be mitigated uh, using, for example, data execution protection or address space layout randomization. And they cannot be detected using uh, static or runtime analysis tools like, uh, for example, prefast and address sanitizer. And that means that if you um, do it the right way, well, black box testing can actually result in some interesting findings. And like I said before, you can do it too. You only need common developer tools. Um, I mean, you can use binary analysis tools if you want. It might get you some background information on why actually uh, stuff is happening, but it is really not necessary uh, to actually find the vulnerability. And so in the end, what you need is just some dedication, some creativity, um, and a little bit of cre curiosity to, uh, to actually uh, find the vulnerability. All right, so if you're interested, I've uh, <coughs> posted up uh, some uh, details on, on a blog post, and you can find them on my uh, website. Thank you for your attention. Anybody here who still runs the Flash in any of their activities? I didn't know that was possible. <laughs> and then if, you don't, if you didn't think it was possible, maybe you didn't take the trouble to turn it off. Well, you uh, should. Any questions should. from here? Right, any questions? Yes. Uh, how do you know where to start when you look through the uh, specifications? Uh, right, well, for me personally, it started as, um, well, Actually, I, I'm, I'm the web developer and uh, I was using Flash and when you develop an application, 
you don't actually uh, immediately realize what's going on until you uh, look at the specs, for example, from a security perspective. And then you notice, okay, there are a bit of um, inconsistencies in the definition. And for me, that meant, well, I just got curious, so I tried some things, and then you get some, some weird behavior, and then you look further, and then you get some more weird behavior. And uh, well, that is actually how I found the first vulnerability. So it was, yeah, just uh, luck, I suppose. So do you think it's still worthwhile to look at? If they still screwed, screwed up the second fix, or do you think they really got it? I, I checked, and they, they really fixed it this time. <laughs> Any other questions? <coughs> are you currently hunting for the next flash bug? Or are you giving up since uh, Chrome is disabling it pretty much always, it, unless yeah. you uh, turn it on by yourself? Well, uh, Chrome is a special case because in Chrome, uh, Flash is um, actually still being used, but it's only for whitelisted domains. Um, and that is actually an interesting thing because, well, who determines what uh, sites are being whitelisted? That's Google in this case. Um, and we've seen, for example, that in trusted websites can also get compromised somehow. And that means that if they abuse any new vulnerabilities in Flash, uh, you still have a problem, unless you specifically turn off Flash in Chrome. Yes? How are you so, so sure that they fixed the second one? Uh, did you have a look at the actual fix, or did you try to find anything and you didn't find anything yet? Uh, well, Flash is a closed source project, of course, so I cannot really tell for sure. But I have um, tried to find some ways, and it didn't work so far. So far. So far. But of course, you're free to try as well. How yes. is Adobe's response, and how is the, the rating of your security of your books and, and the money to be paid uh, returned? Uh, well, Adobe's response was pretty interesting as well, because the first vulnerability is actually uh, the last vulnerability um, that they processed as part of their bug bounty program. I was the last to receive a bug bounty from them because after that, um, well, actually, it's it's even more uh, interesting that because they terminated the bug bounty program while they were still processing my report. <laughs> <laughs> but eventually, they they um, they gave in and they did uh, pay the bounty. But that was the last one. And the second vulnerability I submitted to Trend Micro. Uh, Trend Micro has a vendor agnostic vulnerability program. So they purchase exploits for um, and vulnerabilities for software that is used uh, mostly by the enterprise. And what they do is they develop uh, signatures uh, for their IDS systems and then inform the vendor. So that's, yeah, that's basically uh, Adobe's response. No response for the second one. Any more questions? Okay, if not, let's uh, thank you again. I left the break for 10 minutes and I'll get back here.